Okay. And welcome to the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute and the Tualatin Historical Society uh, Thursday meeting here, November 19th. And tonight we are going to have speaking Bill Burgle talking about Guatemalan volcanoes. So uh, we will hold all questions till later. And Bill, let's turn it over to you. Okay, uh, just a way of um, introduction. My, uh, my pedigree, so to speak, is in engineering and somewhere in the middle of that uh, career, I went back and got a geology uh, master's in, in Idaho State. Uh, same uh, college at Kevin Pope there at Walla Walla, Whitman, and uh, mm -hmm. Nick Zentner, Nick on the Rocks, uh, those two guys went to the same school, so we overlapped there a little bit. Um, I retired from the railroad business I was in in 2010, and ever since then I've spent more and more time uh, with Scott Burns and others uh, doing geology, so that was, that's what bring, brings me here. Um, and I lead a lot of field trips, um, and so I'll go through, if I can do this, uh, is that working for you guys? Let me know if you can see the, the slideshow, um, Sheila or Sylvia, can you see it now? Looks great. I can see it, Bill. All right. So we're going to talk about volcanoes, and this is mostly a, a kind of a travelogue, but I, I couldn't help but throw in a little bit of science in there as well. Uh, I just want to keep your mind stimulated. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about these two uh, volcanic uh, arcs, so to speak, and uh, there's a reason for it, many reasons to compare these two, uh, and I'll go into it. Uh, my own personal reason is, is that I live up here in the Cascades. Uh, can you see the pointer, Sylvia? And uh, Yes, yes, your pointer works fine, Bill, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I live up here with y'all, and, and but I spend a lot of time uh, flying down, and we spend a lot of time in the, uh, let me go to this next one here. Um, I spent a lot of time with this group. Uh, I'm the engineer of this group and we, uh, I'm the guy in the back here. And we uh, go down to South America um, and excuse me, South Central Guatemala uh, near the Honduras El Salvador border and we work uh, fixing kids teeth. Uh, this is an old volcano in the background of the school. That's one of the ones that's in the, uh, uh, Guatemalan volcanic arc. And, uh, we spend a, a couple weeks there. And then the other time we, uh, basically, uh, climb lots of volcanoes is what we do. Uh, just so we're all familiar with, uh, subduction, what that means is that you have uh, the plates, uh, coming together. And whenever, whenever you have an oceanic plate, uh, this bluish uh, color here, which you see out here in the ocean, whenever that uh, encounters the uh, lighter continental crust of a, of a continental plate, uh, this uh, interaction always happens. The, uh, the oceanic crust goes down in what they call subduction. And uh, there's lots of things that uh, can be calculated from that, and this is I'll talk a little bit about science before I get into the travel log, but you can have a difference of rates uh, between the two plates. You can have a fast and, and slow uh, converging rate. Uh, you can also have a real soft angle of, of subduction versus a real steep angle of subduction. Uh, that when you have a fast and deep, uh, a steep subduction, you end up getting more uh, volcanoes from that interaction. You also have another factor, which is the angle of the spreading center uh, to the volcanic arc. Um, that's, that's not well understood. Uh, what is better understood is the distance from the spreading center. If you're really close to the, uh, where the magma gets created, 
and then it gets subducted right away, like what happens up here in, in uh, the Wanda Fuca plate off the coast of Oregon. Uh, the crust is actually, the oceanic crust is still warm, and it's only about five or six million years old, and, and it's not had time to get altered, and it uh, doesn't have a lot of water um, in the, uh, in, in the rocks. And so when it, when it uh, subducts, it's, it's, uh, uh, it behaves differently. It's less prone to creating magma. Uh, then the last factor is how thick your crust is uh, that you're subducting under. These are the two plates uh, in mind. Um, and the topic of, of this um, talk is basically, we're gonna compare the subduction rate with the volcanic eruptive volume that comes out of it. Now, going back to what I said, I, I go down there with my wife who leads the group down to Guatemala, uh, and there's about 35 of us that go down every February. All right, so when we're done with that, you can see, and you'll see in the next few slides, that all these volcanoes down here, uh, here's Guatemala, if you can see the pointer, but all these volcanoes are just going off left and right. And uh, I know that the subduction rate off this Cocos Plate is, is about 12 centimeters a year, or almost five inches a year. It's about uh, three times faster than what we have over here in the Juan de Fuca Plate off the coast of Oregon. So I see all these volcanoes firing off and then I come home and, and really not much goes on up here. So I, I make, I try to, uh, I look at the literature and you'll see that in, in the program here. Uh, if, if there's a relationship between a slow subduction rate, which the Juan de Fuca plate's only going under about 1.6 inches a year uh, versus uh, a faster plate is moving under there and it's got a lot of volcan volcanism. So from a simplistic point of view, um, you know, I, I thought, okay, this is, uh, I do a lot of dragon boating with Jan and, and, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, if he's sitting next to me, I'm going to talk it over with him or Luke or one of these guys are going to say, well, look, if, if you have a, a slow subduction rate um, and not many volcanoes, is there a relationship between those two? Uh, However, uh, even though that sounds pretty simple, right? Um, we'll just, uh, at the end of this talk, we're just gonna call this thing a work in progress. If, if, um, if uh, the scientists in the room can bear with me, you'll see why I'm a little, uh, the more I dug into it, the more confused I got. So you'll see that uh, at the end that um, I'm still working on this thing. Uh, going back to why these two plates are, are, are have a lot of similarities, uh, they were at one time joined. Uh, you go back about uh, 40 or 30 million years ago, um, before Sle or about just after Sletsia docked up here. But you can see that when the uh, Farallon plate uh, impacted the North American plate, and creating the San Andreas Fault here about 20 million years ago, the two plates basically got broken into two and they were connected by the San Andreas Fault uh, 20 million years ago. And you see they continue to uh, separate along, along the transfers fault, transform fault of the San Andreas. And so now Cocos Plate is way down at the southern part and uh, Juan de Fuca Plate is way at the top. So you're, uh, there's some commonality uh, between the two. Um, the Juan de Fuca Plate, the spreading center is much closer to the uh, continental crust um, as opposed to the Cocos Plate, which is much further out. So you're going to have older, altered rock down here in Cocos, which lends itself to volcanism, as opposed to uh, the Juan de Fuca Plate, which is real close to the uh, um, continental crust, so it's going to be a very young crust. Um, all right, so subduction rate and type of crust that gets um, um, subducted, that's one issue. The other issue that's very elusive is that, um, as I mentioned, the how do you actually measure one of these uh, volcanoes? Um, you know, if we all sat down as a group tonight and said, you know, what's important? The obvious, you know, the, the height of the cone and, uh, you know, the cir circumference, the radius up at the top versus the radius at the base. I mean, we can all calculate that and come up with some numbers. Um, and then the whole idea that you get an edifice is strongly dependent on, on, on the magma 
chemistry. And, and then as you know, once, once the uh, magma starts to erupt, uh, all kinds of uh, things can come out of the, out of the spout. Um, in fact, you can have um, uh, vents in, in the crust where, where there's no cone that gets created, um, you know, such as uh, what created the Columbia River basalt, so to speak. Uh, so you get a lot of stuff that falls on the uh, uh, on the land near the near the eruption site. A lot of it blows away, as you know. The uh, asphalt and the pyrocrustic flows they they disappear and they're going to get eroded pretty quick. If you happen to be near a coastline, a lot of it's going to be underwater, which you can uh, you can find as long as you're so equipped with um, a way of getting out there with a the boat and uh, cores to figure out what's out there. Um, and then where we're at, uh, and not so much in, in uh, Guatemala, but glaciation is quite a factor up here and certainly was a factor in how Mount St. Helens erupted uh, back in 1980. Uh, rule of thumb, and I got this from Nick Zentner, but you, you basically your volcanoes only last about 2 million years. Um, and uh, there's a term on how they, the, the geologists have figured out that they're a commonality is the amount of cubic uh, kil uh, cu cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer of the length of the subducting plate is how they measure this volume. So that's the agreed upon convention. A uh, paper that just came out by Dan O'Hare um, suggests that what you see in terms of uh, the edifice of a volcano is, is really just half of what has been erupted. Uh, a little bit about uh, chemistry, um, you can see that in a magma chamber, uh, the longer the magma sits underground, it'll differentiate into these four different types uh, with the heavier, darker materials, uh, iron and magnesium falling to the bottom and the lighter ones like silica floats to the top differentially. Uh, the reason that's important is, is the amount of silica is directly proportional to the uh, amount of viscosity. Uh, a rhyolitic uh, magma will have, uh, will create domes, it's very pasty, it doesn't flow much. Um, there's probably one or two uh, rhyolitic lava flows known to uh, scientists throughout the world. Whereas opposed to basalt and andesite flows are pretty common. Uh, basalt can flow for, you know, 60, 70 miles and still keep its uh, temperature. And it's all based on the, the grabbiness of these uh, oxygen ions in the sil uh, silicon uh, tetraoxide. Uh, the other term you're gonna hear as we talk is, is the so-called decade volcanoes. And these are 16, of uh, volcanoes that uh, they decided uh, back, I think it was about 2005, 2006, where they said these 16 throughout the world are, are, are bad actors. And, uh, and there's three of, of, the, of the 16 that we're gonna talk about tonight. So I'll mention those as we come, but that's a term uh, uh, you should know about. Uh, let's get in with the, uh, the travel part of the show. Um, all right, so you fly into, Ante uh, into Guatemala City, and most people in, in Guatemala head right over to Antigua and over to Atitlan, and this is pretty much the very scenic part of, of Guatemala. Uh, 37 active volcanoes, of which the ones in the, that are shown here, there's about uh, seven or eight of them that are, are extremely active, uh, and the rest of those, uh, the other 30 are, are less so. Um, but, you know, basically we, we make a bi uh, beeline, we fly into uh, the, the map on the left, uh, you see Guatemala City and you see this star, that's pretty much where we go, uh, in a little town called Sada Canarita Mita and work with the, the people there, a small town there. We've been going there for about 10 years. It's considered the wild west of Guatemala and uh, it's a very interesting town. Uh, this is what it looks like underneath uh, um, Guatemala. You have the uh, Cocos Plate over here moving uh, to, the, to the right in this picture in Central America. It's part of the North American Plate moving to the, to the left. And you have the subducting slab going down underneath. And this, what you're seeing represents about half the, uh, uh, this is basically the upper mantle where these dashed lines are and that goes down to the lower mantle and then you get down into the core. So that's what you're looking at. And you can see this slab rem uh, maintains its integrity quite a bit uh, down into the mantle. Um, 
And the reason I show this is basically you've got a, a fairly fast induction going at a fairly steep angle. So it's, it's, it's a prime recipe for uh, creating uh, volcanoes of the edifice type. Uh, this is what you see when you fly into Guatemala City. It's a photo I took outside the window, uh, a plane coming in. You're, you're uh, on the approach uh, to the airport, which is on the south side of the town. Uh, Pacaya is just off to this picture, and uh, you go by Agua, um, and then Fuego we're going to talk about in, in length here in a minute, and then this other is Volcan Acatenango, which was active. It's considered active now, but it's uh, all the activity is coming out of uh, Fuego here and Pacaya. Those are the two that are really going off as we speak. Um, all right, so on one of these, after one of these dental trips, I climbed up here, um, and uh, you're you're this close to the vent. Uh, that's taken with a little bit of a, uh, um, a telephoto lens, but uh, you know you're basically about two miles from the the vent, which is, you know, in my my view, it was uncomfortably close, but. Um, most, as you can see, the uh, ambient wind is, is taking all the fumes away. So uh, the day I was up there, there's basically, there was a lot of people over on, on um, Fuego, uh, which uh, they, don't, they don't encourage. In fact, it's considered illegal, but all the guides will take you up there. This is basically, my tent was at the end there, and we were with a small group of about 14 people. But you climb up to a Catenango, and I'm about, so right now I'm about 9,000 feet up. And at 4 a.m. they wake you up and they take you the other 4,000 feet up to the top of the mountain. It costs about 40 bucks so you can get a tour at the spur of the moment anywhere in Antigua. And basically the first day you climb up to this camp and, and you sleep the night. And again, they wake you up at four and you go up to the top. Um, and then just off to the left of this picture is how you can walk over to Fuego, even though they, they, the guides allow it. Uh, officially, the government of, of Guatemala says you're not supposed to be over there. And I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. But this is a photo I took outside the tent um, as the uh, sun was going down. You can see the sun off to the, or the sunset off to the right of the picture. Uh, but they wake you up at 4 a.m. Now I'm hiking up to the top and you can see the sun coming back up in the dawn in the morning. It's uh, it's about 4.30 in the morning and you've got to climb up uh, 4,000 feet uh, through all this scree. It was uh, it was uh, extremely uh, tedious and, and, and tiring. Uh, and uh, we were with a group that was very slow. So we ended up splitting up and and scampering up to the top with the idea of getting to the uh, summit of Acatenango before the sun, sunrise. Uh, Agua over here, you can see uh, Pacaya has got a small small uh, eruption going on there. Uh, Guatemala City here, and again, most of the tourists, when you come to uh, Guatemala, they hang out in Antigua. A um, little further on, uh, later in the same morning, I was still had the top to uh, to the mountain, but this is what the view looks like. Pacaya is sticking up uh, a little better, a little ground cover there, uh, Agua. And then you finally make it to the top and there's Fuego looking to the south and uh, you're, you're happy you're on top. It's very cold and uh, at 13,000 feet, it was, it was in the 20s. But this is the reason you uh, you really want to stay away from Fuego, and they, they certainly don't encourage people over there. But um, it, it goes off quite regularly. It's probably one of the more explosive uh, volcanoes in the world. And uh, it did go off in, in, a, in a bad way on uh, June the 3rd, 2018. The people that uh, were sleeping where I was on this camp on, on Catenango, they said that the rocks went flying over their heads. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a high risk area where you're at. Um, uh, but it was deadly in that uh, it created a pyroclastic flow that, um, you know, this is a view taken from a cotton angle and this is from the south southeast corner where you can see the flow came down. Uh, the USGS has a pretty good partnership with the um, 
folks in Guatemala, and everybody knew this thing was going to erupt that day. The, uh, the minister that was charged with alerting the people uh, in this uh, area uh, chose to disregard the, the, the announcement. He, uh, this was at 6 a.m. He was notified that uh, they needed to evacuate, and uh, he uh, literally blew them off because they've had many, many uh, false alarms before, and he felt this was another one. About 10 a.m., he, he realized it wasn't, so he went over there and tried to personally get everybody to get up and get out of there, and he was one of the people that was killed in, in the pyroclastic flow that uh, basically this, this builds up straight out of the mountain, out of the volcano, and then when it cools off, it, it, all that ash comes rushing down at uh, high rates of speed. Uh, you can go on uh, YouTube and you can see the, the uh, the flows. A lot of people have taken videos of the pyroclastic flow, and, and a lot of times the uh, vehicle that in which the camera person is in it gets engulfed by the uh, the, the ash ash uh, ash flow. I'll switch over to Pacaya. Uh, Charlotte and I took tours up to the top, 2001, 2004. They had a big eruption in um, in. 2010 and after that um, this is as high as they'll ever let you go uh, we were up there I think in 2016 it was the last time I was up there uh, the eruption in 2010 killed a, a, a newspaper a reporter and a guide and so they they basically wouldn't let anybody up after this thing goes off as often as fuego um, let's see if I can move it ahead here I don't know why it's not going here. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is the view from the uh, the International Airport in Guatemala City, and Fuego, or excuse me, Pacaya sits right at the end of the runway. So, uh, but it's a very common uh, tour. Um, Ten bucks. They run two tours a day: the morning one and the evening, or the afternoon one. And they, they encourage you to do the afternoon one because you get up there and it's. Uh, you can see the glow of the uh, the molten lava. Um, less so now because you don't go as high. Uh, this is my my dear wife and I were up there in uh, 2001, climbed to the very top, and uh, you know certainly you could worry about the magma uh, boiling up and over the crater. But at the time we were up there, this, there was this tremendous electrical storm. You can see Charlotte's hair. Uh, extending in all directions um, with the electric, electrostatic, uh, um, what's ever going on in that uh, storm. Uh, it's the kind of storm where if you just uh, rub your fingers together, the sparks would come off the tips of your finger. And I wasn't all that comfortable being up there. And, and finally, before the volcano erupted and us getting struck by lightning, we, we, we got off and I lived to see the day here. Uh, this is, uh, if you turn around from that picture I just took, uh, this is what you're looking down into, the actual chamber, which, as you guys all know, if this was anything like this in the U.S., you wouldn't be allowed up there, but the, uh, the fumes from the uh, volcano were pretty intense. I mean, it's a very, very strong sulfur dioxide, it, uh, which, you know, as it hits your lungs, it converts to sulfuric acid. So it's not, not necessarily good for you to be up there for lots of reasons. You see the sulfur deposited on the, on the rim. Uh, Charlotte went up again in 2004, uh, there she's on the rim, and she had the, uh, the unbelievably good luck to see the lava flow from Pacaya. And uh, I, I just, uh, We've got these uh, lava shots on the wall here because it's just uh, amazing. The basaltic lava flow is coming down. Uh, going uh, north uh, uh, past uh, Fuego and Acatenango, you get uh, about a three hour drive north of uh, Antigua is, uh, you see the last line in this uh, paragraph, the most beautiful place in the world. I'd, I'd have to echo that. Uh, uh, Elder Huckley said this back in the uh, late 1880s, and uh, uh, this is truly a beautiful spot. So if you, once the COVID's over and you get on an airplane, head to Guatemala City and then make a beeline to Antigua and then come up here and spend a, a week. Um, this is a huge, huge lake. It's bigger than Crater Lake by far. And the center of the Mayan culture, which they were looking at, uh, 
at uh, the actual ambient uh, rise of this caldera uh, in lake level, but the lake level keeps filling and they finally found the, the center of the Mayan culture down about 180 feet. Uh, so it's uh, definitely a, a moving target at the lake level. There's no, uh, there's no drainage, so to speak. Uh, it just keeps um, evaporating and filling as the hurricanes and uh, evaporation cycles go, go forward. Next volcano north is, uh, is basically, this is uh, Santa Maria. And Santa Maria is the mountain we're standing on with the picture. I did not take this picture as a friend of mine took this. And, uh, and it, it's basically, they had a major eruption. It's considered a, uh, um, a decade volcano, mainly because there's a huge uh, city. Quetzal Tenango is just behind us. Uh, if, you, if I turn the other way, you could see it. Uh, but these, these it erupted in, in 1902, and these these four cones uh, uh, rose in about eight, uh, 1921. And uh, I have a friend that lives down there, and I said, "You want to go climb this someday?" And he says, "Not on your life. This stuff is ready to go anytime." So um, uh, these four volcanoes are, are incredibly dangerous. They they don't let anybody over there, but you can climb. Uh, uh, Santa Maria, the one, the one that the picture is taken from. Um, let's see if I can. So that's pretty much uh, it for Guatemala. You can see that's just the uh, volcanoes up in the upper uh, left-hand corner of this slide. But the uh, plate plate continues down. I'll make a real quick uh, um, foray through uh, through these uh, volcanoes on on south. Um, and this is a little close up here. If you, if you add them all up, you have about 82 considered active. And I'd say, uh, they say active in the quaternary. The quaternary is uh, considered about the last 2.6 million years ago. Um, but, you know, given that a volcano only lasts about 2 million years, um, you know, it's real hard to um, really come up with a concrete number of what, what's active, what's not active. But uh, the definition of uh, most geologists is that it's erupted in the quaternary. It's considered active, even though it may not be active in, in our lifetime. Uh, on average, there's about 17 kilometers between volcanoes there in Central America. Um, but this is uh, Masaya. We were there in 2006. Uh, the main highway goes through here between Managua and, and Granada. Uh, but then uh, this thing has since erupted. This is definitely... Uh, uh, one that they're very worried about uh, down there just outside of Managua. Um, and just south of uh, Granada is um, this island out in Lake Nicaragua. It's called Omepete. You take a boat over here and you land here and then you can walk around these volcanoes. This is really a place to head to if you're going to spend some time in Nicaragua. This is a wonderful place to be. This uh, uh, Concepcion, Concepcion is, is active, uh, Madeiras is less so, but uh, a lot of people climb Madeiras um, and we didn't do that. We walked partially around the island in, in 2006 when we were there. Um, we were down in uh, Costa Rica, Arenal, that's uh, right in the center of the country. Uh, recent lava flows there. Uh, and then right next to Iratsu is uh, Tura Alba, which is active. And this one is, is considered uh, less active, but uh, all the volcano activity is only about 10 miles to the uh, right of this picture. They won't let you up on that one. A uh, little bit about Mexico, 48 volcanoes there uh, considered. This is called the uh, Trans-Mexico Volcanic Belt. Um, and uh, I spent a, a fair amount of time down in, uh, in Mexico. I've got 27 kilometers between volcanoes there. Um, you know, very, uh, very active here. Um, uh, you got Ixihuatl, which you can see from the, the, the city of Mexico City. You look to the east and you can see this woman sleeping on, it's called Sleeping Woman, sleeping on the ridge line here. Right next to uh, her is, is Popocatépetl, which is very active. It's actually erupting uh, as we speak. These, these volcanoes are just east of Mexico City and you can step outside where we were at in, 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 in Ciudad de Mexico and, and see uh, these volcanoes. Uh, Colima, I was down there in 2001, took this photo and this thing subsequently erupted several times since I was down there. 
and uh, basically it's erupting now. And this is considered uh, uh, a decade volcano. And this one's uh, due to go off. Uh, you know, I mean, stay tuned. It's considered the second most dangerous volcano in the world uh, for that reason. I uh, did a lot of work over by Veracruz, and you go right by Orizaba. You go through the town of Orizaba when you, you work on the railroad down there. Uh, and I was down there uh, for an extended period of time back in the early 90s. Uh, just to summarize everything down on the Cocos Plate, um, and then I'm going to move to uh, up in, um, a little further north, but you got about 130 uh, volcanoes off this, uh, off this Cocos Plate. Uh, is subducting under there at, at a pretty good rate of speed here. This is Tura Alba, which is uh, active there in Costa Rica. Another shot of Kalema there. Um, basically, so I, I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, if I go to uh, Guatemala and I see all this activity and I come back to Portland um, with a slow subduction rate, there's got to be some, I don't want to talk to you folks about you know, without trying to weigh in with some science. And so uh, I talked to one of my old professors and he sent me this paper, uh, which was developed by a guy who lives down in Trinidad in the, in the uh, Lesser Antilles. And he says, uh, basically, yeah, there's a correlation. Um, sure, yeah, let's, let's go for it. And so he goes through um, all these volcanoes that, that I just, you know, here's Santa Maria and Fuego and Here's uh, down here, here it's uh, Arenal. So all the volcanoes I just ran through, I didn't hit every all of them, but you know they have uh, volumes that produce um, uh, during the past, and and basically you come up with a subduction rate and a, and a uh, volume rate, and you come up with a a rate per year of of, of uh, volcanic activity. So that that's what uh, this uh, gentleman did in uh, 1984. He converted all the uh, ash to what they called uh, dry rock or dense rock equivalent volumes and came up with all these numbers to try to make a, an apt comparison between uh, different volumes. Um, and he did it up here in the Lesser Antilles. And again, you have a very slow subduction rate. Um, this is unbelievably close to what's going off uh, the, the Juan de Fuca. And so I, I thought, okay, I'd hit a gold mine. You have a, a slow subduction rate as compared to a fast subduction rate down on the Cocos Plate. And so you, you can probably take this, uh, what's going on in the Lesser Antilles and, and make that as a, as a basically maybe a, a pattern that I can convert and use up here in the Cascades. Um, again, um, not as many volcanoes, one every 39 kilometers. Uh, they've got 19 with five of them that are that are due to go off at any time. And most of you folks know about this one. This is the one that uh, blew up uh, in 1902, uh, same year as Santa Maria down in Guatemala. But this is the one, as, as you know, uh, there was two survivors. One uh, person was on the outskirts of town and uh, didn't get hit by the blast. And the other one was a uh, person that was uh, down in an underground jail and uh, he was protected from the blast. And so one jailer, one person uh, uh, survived this thing, so to speak. Um, this is the production rates that he calculated um, uh, based on this, the, the very slow subduction, sorry, uh, of the Lesser Antilles. So I thought, okay, you got the slow subduction uh, you end up with, this is the table he, he calculated. He says, basically you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, a one third of the seduction speed uh, between the Lesser Antilles and Central America. But in this case, he, he's in the red circle, he, he basically have uh, about seven times the amount of volcanic material produced by uh, the faster moving plate. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't go much further than this. Um, and then in my research to prepare for tonight's talk, I, I kind of realized that you could, uh, there's a lot of other factors that go into it, uh, namely that one, and he doesn't talk about it in his paper, but the, the one I talked about is the, the uh, how old the crust is when it actually gets subducted and the subduction angle and all that. Those are all factors that go into just, uh, how much volcanic material you get out of that. So 
I kind of thought I was pretty happy and, and I could have ended the, the, the research with that, but I wanted to just make, make sure of my facts before I uh, got in front of you. And uh, so I'm going right now back up into the, um, into the Cascades here. And let's just talk a little bit about uh, what's close to home here. Um, you know, it's about uh, the same length as the uh, Central America uh, thing, it's about 1,200 kilometers. It's um, much slower than, than the Cocos Plate. It's a very uh, um, flat subduction when it, when it hits the, uh, the, the, the uh, trench, the, uh, where the uh, continent, uh, continental crust and the oceanic crust. It's a very soft angle and then it steepens at depth uh, down to 60 degrees as composed to the, <coughs> the you know, the uh, Cocos Plate. Uh, you got a lot more people that live near here, uh, near the, uh, the Cascade Range. And the paper that I'm going to cite here in a minute uh, shows 20 major events, but it shows uh, an enormous number. They, they went through and counted it. each one of these minor events, which you guys know most of the, about the, the boring lavas, that sort of thing. Um, the old Cascades, the Western Cascades are much older. They're 40 million years. The High Cascades, which you see now, they're less than a million years old. And they came up with this uh, about one kilometer, cubic kilometer per kilometer of uh, length for a million years. And so I thought I was on to something. Um, again, here's uh, what the, the volcanoes looked like in terms of distribution. You see the, uh, the red is the, uh, basically the, uh, the anacidic, uh, uh, mixed with some basalt uh, core of the of the Cascades. The yellow is is basically all these uh, what they call volcanic fields. Uh, Newberry, um, Simcoe Mountain up in uh, Lower Washington. You got Medicine Hills and down there uh, by Medicine Lake, so to speak. Um, you, you see that the uh, crust over here on the on the right hand picture is 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 pretty pretty brand new. It's less than six million years old before it gets subducted. Um, these are all the, the what they considered very, very high threat uh, volcanoes. Um, and this is taken right from the, uh, uh, the Cascades Volcan Volcanic Observatory uh, website. I just copied that and put that right here. Um, and then we've got basically 15 active volcanoes. So, you know, they're a lot further spaced apart up here in the, in the Cascades. Um, and uh, another shot of subduction. And uh, as Sheila and others know, we, we've got a docking of the Sletz River about uh, 49 million years ago against us, 53 to 49 million years against us. Um, but um, this is a shot of the the underpinnings of the of the subducting pl uh, plate that goes underneath the Cascades, fairly flat angle up here, and then it deepens uh, as it, it gets further inland. As composed, you can compare these two between uh, this is uh, the Cascades and this is the uh, much deeper angle of the uh, under Central America off the Cocos Plate. Uh, so that you know, a lot of people have been wondering why why the Cascades have been so quiet, and that's certainly one of the reasons I thought I would do this talk because I, I try, was trying to figure out why the, the difference between what goes on down in Central America and you know because you know I lived through the uh, uh, I was in Idaho when the Mount St. Helens went off in 1980, but you know really realistically in the last hundred years there's only been the two, so um, a little pictorial up in the corner really doesn't show much in terms of going off here. I mean, pretty minor ones to speak of. Uh, shot of Mount Lassen, Lassen Peak as it's called. Uh, this is the 1857 painting for Mount St. Helens. Um, Mount St. Helens in 1980. And, and then you had the, uh, the big one that uh, went off in uh, 7,700 years ago in terms of um, losing its top, lost the top 4,000 feet. Uh, in fact, I heard not too long ago on NPR, but it, it showed that the Mazama ash is uh, important because it was the first time they, they used to carbon date some of the uh, Indian artifacts that were underneath the uh, 
uh, Masama ash, and they wanted to know the date of the Masama ash, and so they, they found that out through carbon dating. Um, anyway, so a little quiz for you guys. Um, you know, of all the volcanoes, you know, you got Shasta, you got Rainier, you got uh, all up and down, uh, which is the largest Cascade volcanoes. And if you got a, a chat, a minute to type it into your chat box, uh, go ahead and we'll see who can get that first. Um, so the Cascade volcano, uh, that's the largest. In terms of, I threw this back in here because uh, here's another hint. Um, the edifice building is strongly dependent on the magma chemistry. So I'll, I highlight that uh, for a second time here. Uh, the volcano itself is 75 miles long and, and 27 miles wide. Um, another hint, it's uh, primary basalt uh, with later eruptions of uh, rhyolite and dacite. And for you scientists in, in the audience, you certainly know that basalt tends to make uh, shield volcanoes and uh, and if you're talking about a shield volcano it may not be obvious uh, which is the most uh, the large the largest cascade volcano because it doesn't tend to build an edifice uh, but here it goes here's your answer um, Newberry is considered the by far the biggest uh, volcano and it's uh, so very active uh, and going back to that initial slide uh, where I showed you the um, active volcanoes, it's right up there in terms of, uh, uh, it used to be quite high. This is all a caldera here uh, that you're seeing. Uh, it's huge. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as folks that have been to Hawaii know that uh, basalt tends to create low flat volcanoes. So when you drive up here from 97, you, you climb 3,500 3, feet up. Uh, so it's quite a quite a climb and that's all the basalt and as you guys know um, this flows all the way north to the Crooked River so it flows about 50 miles to the north and uh, kept pushing the Crooked River against uh, Smith Smith Rock which is um, as you know um, the precursor to one of the Yellowstone uh, uh, eruptions. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the one decade volcano we have in our midst. Uh, Sheila and I gave a symposium a couple years ago to some folks from China that really wanted to know about our early warning systems. This thing uh, is not considered to be explosive per se, but it's got uh, 43 glaciers on it uh, that with just the, uh, the right type of eruption, it's going to melt all that water. Um, the ice cap on top of the, basically you have a lot of fumaroles up there at the top of Rainier, a lot of sulfur. You mix water and sulfur together and it's trapped by the uh, glaciers. Most of that percolates down into the rock layers at the top of the, uh, the, the edifice there at Rainier. And basically that, that basically makes all that rock that's holding up the the cone of Rainier, it makes it all rotten. And so you get a, a very slight uh, tremor up there, uh, or you get just a, a slight eruption where you get a lot of heat uh, that's trapped uh, in by the, by the ice cap. You're gonna have a, a, a pretty dramatic mud flow, a lahar that's gonna flow is in this case, all the way to um, uh, Tacoma and beyond. Uh, Sheila, I haven't talked to you, but I, I drove through Ording the other day, and uh, and those folks, and if you, any of you in the audience know anybody in, in this Ording, Carbondale, Buckley area, uh, this is not a good place to be living um, in terms of, they're probably in, in more risk than we might be with a subduction quake, because these canyons are two to three hundred feet high, um, and I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know, you, you're going to have maybe about a half hour warning is all, because this water will flow down, this lahar will flow down at 50, 60 miles an hour. Anyway, that's, that's probably, the, that's why this is one of the more dangerous volcanoes in, in the Pacific Northwest or in the world. Um, this paper just came out this month, and I've been talking to Dan O'Hare and, and Leif uh, Karlstrom about uh, the talk I was going to give tonight. And, you can see all the cones that he's got. Uh, most of these up here where the, where the pointer is, is the Portland area. 
all this down here is Newberry. This is Medicine Lake down by uh, just south of Klamath Falls and then Rainier and Baker, Baker way up north here. So, I mean, he goes on and basically has uh, a pretty good, he's doing this uh, very scientifically. And, and, and the reason I bring this paper out here is I think he's hit on a methodology to, to create very, very accurate uh, uh, renditions of a volcanic volcanic volume and I I would basically on all the volcanic volcanic arcs throughout the world I would recommend that uh, this methodology be used and standardized and I basically have recommended that to, to anybody that cares to listen to me uh, but basically let's wrap this up now and just so what I was talking about I mean you have these uh, different uh, volcanic uh, arcs, so to speak, and you got different subduction zone. And I started out with the premise that you had, a, uh, you know, if you had a fairly, uh, you can see the Cascades that when it interacts with the North American plate, it's fairly soft angle, but then it steepens in depth. Uh, but you got this fast and steep subduction up here with Central America with old uh, hydrated uh, basalt that gets in there. So you're going to produce a lot of, of um, uh, volcanoes uh, down there. And, and so that kind of went with my uh, visual uh, observation while I was down there um, on the dental team. The uh, Lesser Antilles, you know, basically you've got a slow subduction rate and you have, uh, you know, a, a much uh, less volume uh, produced. And then so here comes this... Uh, a new study out that, that basically it says to me it kind of uh, supports what I, I'm trying to get it to say. However, I, I one of the papers that uh, Dan cited in his paper was this one, Hildreth, 2007, and I read it. And so you get to the point where they talk uh, about the productivity of the Cascades as compared to the other uh, uh, volcanic arts. And you see he's got quite a bit of uh, production here. And, and I think uh, when, he, when I saw that, I says, well, how does that compare to that of the uh, uh, Central America volcanic art? And you can see up here on the upper, upper right-hand corner, it's, it's about half. And so all of a sudden, um, my, my nice pat little theory that, that the, the two were related, that, you know, if you have a fast uh, subduction rate, you're going to get more vo volcanic volume, doesn't really hold up. So uh, I kind of had to, uh, you know, basically bite the dust on this, this theory, so to speak. So um, I'm calling this now a work in progress, Sheila. So more, more, more to follow. I, I've learned a lot, but there's still a lot more to learn. And uh, so, I mean, this is what I thought I could do in my spare time. But you know, I, I'm not 100% certain that the time periods and the arc lengths are all, uh, you know, consistent. I want to be a little bit sure about that. And I'm not sure exactly uh, of the methodologies they use to create all the volcanic uh, volumes, and, you know, because you're, you you lose a lot in terms of uh, glaciation up here in the Cascades. So, I mean, is that how is that calculated? Uh, and then I, I guess I have to be a little bit. Uh, I have to get off my my uh, highfalutin uh, uh, view on on seeing all these volcanoes and, and realizing that maybe that could. Could have misled me a little. Maybe maybe the volcanoes are a little more voluminous up here. So anyway, so I have a, a big mea culpa to you all, but uh, that's really uh, all I have for tonight. And uh, I do want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. We sure appreciate that. Yeah. And. Uh, so let's check the chat here. Hmm. Okay, so uh, Jerry Tunstall actually said Newberry Crater. Hey. And, uh, Mark and Lisa Newberry. Wow. So you guys are right on. Okay. So uh, Scott 
says, please explain significance of hydration for ocean crust material. Yeah, so what happens with the hydration is, um, all right, so, you know, you got the ocean itself, and then, you know, as soon as the lava, you know, gets erupted and then forms into a, a oceanic crust at the, at the spreading center, uh, you know, the water starts to act on it right away. Uh, but it, it takes time to do that. And uh, some of the stuff down there in the coast, coast, coast um, Cocos uh, uh, plate has been um, subducting uh, some of that oldest rock. I should have put that in there, but it's about 15 to 16 million years old. So it's twice to three times as old as some of the rock that's uh, being subducted under the, uh, the, the uh, Juan de Fuca plate up here in the Pacific Northwest. In that time, it gets a, a chance to basically hydrate the rocks. And, and uh, what happens when you mix uh, water with um, uh, tholeitic basalt is you get something called serpentinite. It just makes it, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot more, it, it absorbs a lot more water. And then when the water uh, gets subducted down under the plate, uh, it ends up uh, lowering the melting point of, of the magma and it, it basically produces more, uh, it tends to produce more uh, magma uh, when, when you lower the, the melting point. So that's kind of the, the quick and dirty on, on why um, a hydrated rock sample is, or a rock a slab is a lot more likely to produce magma as, as opposed to the, the fairly fresh basalt that's trying to subduct under our plate here now. All right, and I think you said, just said uh, there, water also lowers the melting point of rock, so. Oh, she, she and I are a team, so yeah, she's helping me here. All right, good. Great, much appreciated. All right, we'll open it up for uh, vocal questions. If anyone has a uh, question, go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, actually, Mark and Lisa, is Guatemala more prone to subduction quakes and larger quakes, tsunamis? Yes, yes, and all, all, all three. Um, the um, We've been going down there, say, for 10 years, and in that 10 years, they've had two, uh, two or three uh, sevens, 7 7.1 earthquakes. Um, the, um, uh, the town of Antigua uh, used to be located on uh, closer to the, the volcano, and it's called, uh, the, the volcano there is called Agua, and Agua it was so named because um, they had a, a crater lake up, up on top, uh, you know, in, in the crater. And uh, they had a, a slight tremor, but it broke the uh, rim of the crater and uh, all that water came rushing down and wiped out the old town of Antigua. Mm. Uh, so it, that's how the, the volcano got its name, Volcan de Agua. And uh, subsequently, they moved the uh, town over to uh, where it is now. And I think it was 1524 is when that happened. Mm -hmm. The uh, thing that, uh, again, this is why the travel log, but you, you do want to go to uh, Antigua and look around. You'll see a lot of churches that are <coughs> been damaged. And those were mostly damaged in, uh, I think it was the quake of 1777. Um, Right in that area or a time time area time frame, so to speak. But it 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 was uh, it was another seven point six or so. Um, so yes, they they get lots of quakes. Uh, Mexico City, as you guys know, uh, sits on a lake, and it 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 was tremendously damaged in the nineteen eighty five uh, quake off. This is again the uh, Cocos Plate going under the uh, uh, you know the North American Plate, which is Mexico there. Uh, so yeah, lots of uh, big volcanoes, lots of tsunami warnings, so to speak, uh, on that west coast. Uh, I was down in Costa Rica, and you know, and I looked at the shoreline, and you could see that the shoreline had just gotten raised up, um, and you could see that just as you know. And I said, "Well, when did they have a quake?" And they said, "Well, this was about six years prior to 
when I was down there. So yeah, lots of lots of volcan uh, earthquakes to go hand in hand with the vol volcanic activity. Anybody else? Hey, Luke, you got to have a question. This is not Wisconsin, man. Unmute yourself. Uh, he's he's kind of he's kind of shy. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has a question, go ahead, unmute yourself, and just ask. Just opening it up here. Uh, hey, Bill. This is yeah. Charles. Yeah, Charles. Uh, what, what on the uh, picture of the Newberry volcano? Uh, what is that body of water that was in the lower left-hand corner? Is that a lake? Because it's not near. It's not near the Pacific Ocean. It's inland, isn't it? Yeah. It's um, if you go south of Bend and uh, about twenty miles south of Bend, and then you drive about fifteen miles east of 97 you get up into uh, that's called Paulina Lake oh, I um, you can walk around that it's it's about a seven mile walk and there's some hot springs uh, there Charles um, there's that lake and then the uh, lake on the east side of the there's a volcano in the middle uh, between the two uh, and that's called East Lake not very imaginative but uh, yeah. That I whole area that. is one huge caldera, so it's it's definitely yeah. uh, active. Go ahead. Yeah. I was also thinking of Yellowstone, but that's not in the Cascades. But Yellowstone is a different huge different example. process. Different process. Yeah. 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 yeah that that one's uh, what what they call a super volcano. Um, hot spot. Yeah, and they, you know, that's mostly rhyolite too. Uh, rhyolite tends to produce uh, the more explosive volcanoes because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of pasty. Um, you know, or a basalt will, will fountain like uh, like Kilauea there in the Hawaiian Islands. So that's that's uh, almost a hundred percent basalt mm -hmm. uh, over there. Um, you know, and one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned in Newberry, it, about a million years ago, it, it flowed all the way up towards uh, uh, Madras and that area. It's all, all that, the capping of all those rocks you drive as you drive on Highway 26 down by Warm Springs. Uh, that upper rock all comes from Newberry, so that's 50 miles to the, to the south there. Yeah. Do you work with Betty down in Guatemala? We have oh, yeah. a friend, Betty, who goes down to Guatemala every year to yeah. work in the dental clinic. Yeah, no, oh, Betty okay. Buford, right. Yeah, she's yeah. she's part of the team, you bet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, my wife and I have been going down there many years. So you live near Betty? Yes, we're in Master Gardeners together. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I've known Betty for, well, she's active in neighborhood politics too so okay yeah we have another question from scott please discuss hazard level of mount hood rated almost as dangerous as rainier yeah uh, so so the here's the story i mean you know you guys know all about the harmonic tremors that they they measure uh basically they that's how they diagnosed that uh, mount st helens was coming alive um, there's been quite a bit of activity up on, on Mount Hood. However, they don't they don't feel like it's associated with the movement of of, of magma down in the magma chamber. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a guy by the name of Ray Wells who who does a lot of work on the rotation. Uh, the whole state of uh, Oregon, basically, if you put a uh, pin at, at Pendleton and tried to rotate the whole state around the city of Pendleton, you would get a sense of the motion of, of this rotation, this north northward uh, rotation that comes down through here. And so most of, most of the, I think some of that volcanism, or excuse me, the, the seismicity is due to that uh, northwest uh, rotation through here. Uh, the Gales Creek Fault has got about 12 kilometers of offset on that uh, uh, there's a, a 
professor at uh, Portland State, Ashley Steg, who, who does that work. But um, there's a lot of uh, a relief going on in terms of all this uh, seismicity, not necessarily even though it's associated uh, with the volcanoes. They, they're, not, they're not pinning that on to the movement of magma. It's more, uh, uh, I think it's more the uh, local tectonic stresses that are going on. Um, however, saying that, uh, and I'm 71 years old, soon to be 72, I have said in my lifetime to anybody that uh, cares to sit next to me in a dragon boat, but uh, I have said that uh, I think in my lifetime we're going to have Hood, uh, Rainier, and, uh, and St. Helens. One of those three are going to go off, so I don't know which one. But I'm not... Uh, if, uh, uh, I only have another uh, 10 years off, before I'm gone. If Hood goes huh? off, how is Portland going to fare? I said, if Hood goes off, how is Portland going to fare? Well, uh, I think we'll do okay. Again, the ambient uh, wind is to the to, from the west to east, so most of the ash will head towards uh, Nebraska. Um, but, you know, they had an eruption in 1790. I probably should have put that on that list. Uh, but it was what they called the old maid's flat uh, um, eruption. And then that, uh, by the time Lewis and Clark came through in uh, 1804 down at the mouth of the Sandy River, uh, that's how the Sandy River got its name. They, they saw this uh, recent volcanic activity, and uh, so they named the Sandy River uh, thusly because of the recent volcanic, uh, because of the old maid eruption there on Mount Hood. Uh, 15 years earlier. Um, I think it, you know, it's, I haven't seen anything definitive, but, you know, I, I think what, while it's active, they, I, they're thinking that it, he's going to have an eruption similar to that, you know, a fairly small scale eruption, but um, as opposed to Mount uh, St. Helens, which they think is still, still primed to have another explosion, you know, um, again, nobody really knows, but, uh, there's a guy by the name of Molino that predicted that one within, you know, he said within the next 20 years. And he said that in 1978. So he was, he was very accurate. He sure was. We spend a lot of time up around government camp. And I've always thought that if the mountain woke up, you don't want to head towards Sandy. You want to either head south past Timothy Lake, or you want to head towards Warm Spring. Is that um, a correct assumption? Yeah. Um, let's see. Again, uh, the old maid eruption didn't uh, really, it just had a, a minor flow. Um, it just basically, it, it, it fountained, you know, it just made a, it basically melted the snow cap is what it did. And that all that water uh, came down the Sandy River. Uh, you can still see that um, there's a lot of uh, debris from the lahars that came down the Sandy River. Um, so um, I think that was really the extent of the uh, the damage. Um, you know, again, that's considered a, a fairly minor eruption. Was that on the western side of Mount Hood, the Sandy River? Yeah, yeah. On uh, Old Maid is. Uh, if you if you're up there at Timberline and you're looking um, uh, towards Silcox, it's to your to your left. Yeah, it'd be on the southwest corner of, of Hood is called Old Maid Flats. I see. Yeah. Um, if you go over by Parkdale, you can see a, a pretty good sized lava flow over there too. And that's an antacidic flow that I think was it's not that old. I, I used to know how old it was. Uh, I'll I'll send that out to y'all. But it's it's pretty recent too. It's in the last two thousand years or so. Wow. Ian wrote in the comment: "If Hood goes, there goes the water supply." Yeah. Yeah. Full run. Yeah. Uh, you know they're you're spending all. You guys have probably noticed down there by. Uh, um, Oh, you know where that Mercedes dealer is across the street from uh, the Marriott down there uh, near River Place. But, you know, they're digging a, a big hole in, in, the, in the ground there. And what that hole is for is to build a new pipeline um, 
you know, for the bull run, uh, they, they don't have a, a high degree of confidence that the water from bull run will make it across the Willamette if we have a subduction zone quake uh, before they get that new pipeline in. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're spending a lot of money to drill a new, new uh, pipeline underneath the Willamette, and that's where they're, they're doing it. So if you go by there, they're, they're working on that as we speak. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Thank you. That's nice to know. Um, is that, is that over here at the River Place Hotel across the street from? Yeah, from if you hotel? yeah if you if you go over by the River Place and just walk to the kind of south there a little bit, you'll see the, all the construction going on there. It used to be a parking lot. It was up on the hill next to that Mercedes dealer. Uh, but that's, um, that, they're drilling that. That's the new pipeline for uh, uh, BES that connect, connects the, uh, uh, the water supply. You know, that's a good question. I, I, you know, we're, they're, they're relatively sure that, uh, that the water supply, they lost it, you know, and the, uh, the 96 flood, they, they lost a uh, connection across, uh, I think it was the Sandy River out there, but they, uh, I don't know, they had some sort of, anyway, they've, they've, they've gotten that all prepared too. So they're, they're thinking that if they go ahead and put this new um, lake underneath the river, they'll, they'll be able to supply water to all you folks west of the river. And also they're remodeling the, the reservoir in Washington Park. It where? At Washington Park, that's undergoing a lot of construction. Oh, I yeah, guess yeah. A cover yeah. The reservoir. yeah, they've since uh, they put a new reservoir up on Tala Butte, and they still use just one of the reservoirs on Mount Tabor. Uh, the rest are just or ornamental now. Um, but the number two reservoir, which is on the north side, which is covered, uh, that's still in use. Um, the water engineer that put all the water system in there in 1894 was, was pretty darn sharp. He was the one who put the... Uh, There's no pumps in it. <laughs> right, no pumps, right. Yeah. Boy. I'm sorry, this didn't have much to do with uh, Ice Age floods, but you know, one of these days we'll get, get back to Ice Age flood stuff, Sheila, uh, Sylvia. It's more like New Age floods. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is geology uh, related, which a lot of our programs are. And uh, like last month, it wasn't even geology. It was just current events and such and, uh, you know, earth sciences. So they, they all fit in and I think yours did very well. So uh, let's all give Bill a hand. And, uh, okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so very much. Yeah, uh, once this COVID stuff is over, yeah, you want to hightail it down to Guatemala. It's a thank wonderful you country. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. Stay well, everybody. Thank you, okay. Bill. Go IFE.